Hello, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to open this session um, uh, about future applications for treatments of infectious diseases, inherited diseases, and chronic disorders. Um, Peter Collis will be giving us a, a keynote um, about his uh, projects um, with uh, lipid nanoparticles. Um, a couple of words to introduce him. He's a Canadian physicist and biochemist, best known for his contributions in the field of uh, lipid nanoparticles. He's the director of the Nanomedicines Research Group and professor at the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology within the University of British Columbia. Um, about his uh, achievements in the back in the 1980s he established his own laboratory at the university of british columbia and he founded a company named inex pharmaceuticals where they researched ways to encapsulate drugs as well as nucleic acids within particles um, his work has contributed to five different drugs that have received clinical approval these days. Um, Dr. Collis has also co-founded uh, staggering 11 biotechnology companies, one of them being um, Acuitas, I think is probably the best known one, um, and that these companies employ now over 300 people. Um, he's also published over 350 scientific articles and is an inventor of over 60 patents. He has also co-founded three not-for-profit enterprises during, his, uh, during the, uh, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Dr. Callis has also re received numerous awards, including the Order of Canada um, last year, as well as the Vin Future Prize, just to name a few. Um, two recently approved drugs, that are enabled by lipid nanoparticles delivery systems uh, de devised by Dr. Kallis uh, deserve special emphasis. The first one is uh, on Patro, which uh, was approved by the US FDA in August 2018 to treat the uh, previously fatal disease. Um, on Patro is also a pioneering um, a medicine that first employed the mechanism of uh, RNA interference. And uh, the second product is uh, probably better known, and uh, most of us have had it, or some of us have had it in the upper deltoid muscle, um, BioNTech <laughs> Pfizer, BioNTech Pfizer vaccine, um, called Comirnaty. Um, so now, um, just to briefly, the, the questions can you can ask questions after the two talks that will be held now um, in the debate room. So please. Uh, I'll spare your questions for later. Um, now, Peter, please take the stage. Okay, thanks very much, Stefan. And I will uh, share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? <clears throat> so can people see my screen? Uh, Stefan, maybe, okay, okay. Yeah, I can see that you're nodding. So I assume that uh, we're, we're in business. Uh, the, um, so this is, uh, I'm just going to talk a bit, I'm going to give a, a bit of a historical uh, viewpoint. Um, the lipid nanoparticles, gene therapy, and the Pfizer vaccine, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, but really the, uh, <clears throat> the subject is how I've spent 50 years worrying about lipids and lipid nanoparticles, uh, the, um, which is kind of a long time. The, uh, a few conflicts of interest is indicated uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom. So what I'm going to cover, and I think I'll just adjust my pointer here. Uh, where are we here? What I'm going to cover are some basic studies that really led to uh, <clears throat> the uh, the advances in um, in drug delivery, uh, first of all, and then which are still going on. I should have put this to 2022. Um, <clears throat> the development of cancer drugs, antisense and sRNA-based drugs, and mRNA-based drugs, and then just point out uh, towards the, right at the end, uh, the number, I mean, uh, I'll give a very short uh, summary of some of the advances that are, uh, the new products that are being developed, but it won't be comprehensive because this field is moving extraordinarily quickly. 
Um, okay, 50 years of lipids. I, I, I got a PhD, my PhD in, in solid state physics uh, in, uh, in 1972. I was doing magnetic resonance, but I really thought that the most interesting problems that uh, I could see were um, really well outside the field of physics. And so I said, okay, well, maybe I can apply NMR in the life sciences. And um, I, uh, <clears throat> I was awarded a, a postdoc to go to uh, Oxford, to the biochemistry department in Oxford. And I obviously knew a bit about NMR, but I knew absolutely nothing about biochemistry. So I didn't even know what a protein was. Uh, so it was, a, um, it was really a, a, a baptism by fire, if you want. But I did manage to get to get going. So when I got to Oxford, this was in 1973, uh, <clears throat> the, um, you learn a few things as a physicist. One is you learn a technique in some depth. You also learn that uh, when a machine isn't available um, that you want, you, you better build it. And uh, so this has actually helped when I uh, got to Oxford because they had a, a, uh, an NMR machine. It was basically the magnet, but we had to build all the electronics to go with it, me and a graduate student. Uh, so um, <clears throat> so the, uh, that was one of my first tasks when I, when I got uh, to, uh, to the biochemistry department at Oxford. The, um, the third thing is going after basic problems. Um, and certainly physicists like to go after the most basic problems uh, that they are. And so I use the NMR machine uh, to study lipids in biological membranes. And this is a, a model of a biological membrane much, uh, <clears throat> it, was at this, it hasn't changed all that much since 1970 when it was basically introduced the Singer-Nicholson model. And the lipids playing a fundamental role in providing the lipid bilayer uh, of a biological membrane. So I got interested in the basic science of, the, of these lipids. And uh, the thing that particularly fascinated me, well, there's two things. Um, what, but one, one was that if you extract lipids from a membrane and then put them in water, uh, over 50% of the lipids will adopt non bilayer structures. And so, okay, it's interesting. What are they there for? Uh, so that was uh, that was one aspect. The other basic question was: uh, lipids the membranes have asymmetric transpiler distributions. In other words, the lipids on one side of the membrane are different from the lipids on the other side. And of course, there are ion gradients of sodium, potassium, protons, etc. And so I was at, I, I was interested whether or not we could generate lipid asymmetry in response to ion gradients. And what are the consequences of, uh, of asymmetric transpiler distributions of lipids? So what we discovered was that uh, <clears throat> that phosphorus NMR uh, for phospholipids, obviously the phospholip there's a phosphorus in the head group, uh, could be used to study uh, lipid polymorphism. And so you take the lipid dehydrate, it then be extracted from a membrane, um, <clears throat> and then re remove the organic solvent that it's soluble in add water and uh, they, will, they will adopt spontaneously structure, uh, structures such as the bilayer structure. And that gave rise to an asymmetric line shape, uh, low field shoulder, high field peak. Uh, <clears throat> just, uh, this is simply reflects the axial, axial rotation of these molecules. Uh, whereas in the hexagonal phase, which consists of aqueous tubes, long aqueous tubes that are about seven or eight nanometers in diameter, uh, the uh, lipids can also diffuse rapidly around these aqueous tubes, and this gives rise to a different line shape uh, with, a, with a, high, a low field peak, high field shoulder, so a different signature. And so we can start to uh, get a, a picture of the, uh, of the phase behavior of lipids uh, by these relatively simple uh, NMR uh, investigations. And together with Ben de Krauf of the University of Utrecht in Holland, uh, <clears throat> we examined a large number of lipids uh, by primarily by NMR, and um, we proposed what we termed the shape hypothesis uh, to explain why lipids adopt, adopted different structures. And so the uh, so lipids that are in a in a bilayer have kind of a cylindrical shape, where the head group subtends the same area as the acyl chains, whereas those that prefer hexagonal H2 phase have more of a cone shape, a smaller head group area. Than the acyl chains. You may wonder what this has to do uh, with the uh, delivery or with the delivery of, um, of, uh, of, of drugs, but I will take you through that uh, in, in a while. So we then asked what the functional roles of lipids, of these non bilayer lipids are. We showed uh, using liposomal systems, lipid bilayer systems, 
that the presence of, uh, of these non-bilayer lipids, such as phosphatidylethanolamine, really engendered a fusion be between these, these vesicles and, uh, and plays a direct role in membrane fusion in vivo. Of course, that's vital to all aspects of life. Um, <clears throat> We also use these liposomes to demonstrate the consequences of lipid asymmetry. And uh, to, in order to do that, we synthesize what we term an ionizable cationic lipid that had the property uh, that at, uh, at low pH, it became proteinated and was positively charged with this tertiary amine. Uh, <clears throat> whereas at neutral pH, uh, the, uh, the, the neutral form, the, the, the proton dissociates, we have the neutral form of, the, of this molecule. And so, the uh, what we what we could use this this ionized lipid for was uh, we could flip it across the membrane. If we had a vesicle with a, let's say a low pH on the inside, uh, then the uh, the lipid would could, the neutral form of the lipid could move across the membrane very easily, uh, become protonated on the inside, can't get back out, and so you can because charged molecules don't go through lipid bilayers very easily. And so you can start to drive uh, lipid asymmetry and look at the consequences of, of, the, uh, of, of, that, uh, of that asymmetry. So <clears throat> the, um, and, uh, again, I'll come back to this because this provided a rather a useful molecule uh, for subsequent uh, studies, particularly with nucleic acids. Now, the, uh, we really got, at this point, we really got distracted by the drug delivery potential. Uh, in order to measure these uh, pH gradients, uh, the, we used methylamine, radio labeled methylamine. It's a weak base and has this, uh, so it exists either in the protonate or neutral form. Uh, and the neutral form is highly membrane permeable. You have a pH gradient, it goes inside, becomes protonated. And so you drive, a, uh, you drive an accumulation of this, uh, of this uh, molecule on the inside. And it's easy to show that at equilibrium uh, the concentration of methylamine inside over that outside mirrors the proson gradient. And so for a three unit um, pH gradient, you have a thousand times higher concentration of the, uh, of the methylamine on the inside. And so this, this was uh, to us of, of academic interest. And so we realized that many anti-cancer drugs are weak bases. And so this is just indicating that for, for doxorubicin, uh, and what we found was that with the, if we had a pH gradient across these vesic across vesicles, uh, we could then uh, load, in this case, doxorubicin to such high levels that it precipitates on the inside. And uh, of course, provides a rather good um, <clears throat> delivery system for, for doxorubicin. So what we did was we formed, this was in, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, we formed uh, Idex Pharmaceuticals, uh, this is me and four postdocs in my lab, uh, to develop uh, liposomal formulations of, uh, of anti-cancer drugs. And I should say one of the driving forces for me in, in, in forming companies is that it's a great way of keeping a team together. Um, it's uh, in academia, uh, it's very difficult to keep a high performing uh, team together over the longer term. Uh, by forming a company, uh, we really we're still working together 40 years later, which which really says something. Really says something. However, in the mid 90s, uh, <clears throat> we started to work on gene therapy. So I, we'd hired uh, Jim Miller to be the CEO, and um, this is we, we, as, as I said, we we started INX to deliver cancer drugs. But uh, one day Jim came to me and said, I can't raise money putting old drugs in liposomes. We need to be doing gene therapy, which is kind of in vogue, uh, has much more sex appeal. Those, those were his exact words. And so the, uh, this, this um, started us off on a whole new path. Now, the first problem, of course, was that uh, in order to encapsulate uh, negatively charged nucleic acid polymers in a lipid-based lipid system, uh, you have to use cationic lipids. Uh, you can see here just conceptually how that's going to give you a hydrophobic entity. Uh, but um, <clears throat> the cationic lipids, these are the ones available then, are really toxic. There's, there's no positively charged lipids in membranes. It's only net neutral lipids or negatively charged lipids. And uh, so permanently positively charged lipids were out of the question because uh, they're just way too toxic in an in vivo setting. So what we did was we tried DODAP, this is the ionizable cationic lipid, and asked the question wh whether we could uh, load nucleic acid polymers at pH 4, where it's positively charged, 
and then was the would the uh, would the uh, oligonucleotides be retained when we raise the pH to pH seven point four? And this turned out to be a uh, a, a pretty useful. Uh, it turned out to work very well. Uh, we have the RNA DNA in water at pH four, um, and then have the ionizable cation lipids plus a, a couple of other lipids that are more in the stabilizing uh, <clears throat> stabilize the particle. Uh, and then uh, have these dissolve in ethanol, uh, mix them rapidly. One of the first things to fall out of solution is the oligo surrounded by the, uh, the positively charged ionizable cationic lipid. Do this fast enough, and then uh, the PEG lipids, as is indicated here, uh, will deposit as <clears throat> will fall out of solution as well. And you can, if you do this fast enough, you can trap these uh, these uh, systems in what you term limit size systems. In other words, the smallest systems that are compatible with the molecular makeup. That lies away, that lies away the ethanol and raise the pH, and uh, you have the lipid nanoparticle. These are the cryo TEMs up on the upper right here, 100 nanometer bar here. And you can see they have a solid core as opposed to an aqueous core that we associate uh, with. Um, <clears throat> so these, these are, these are uh, hydrophobic entities, uh, which are indistinct to normal liposomal structure. Most importantly, relatively non-toxic encapsulation efficiencies of 100%. Uh, we can adjust the diameter by changing the surface lipid to core lipid ratio, scalable reproducible technique. Now, the, um, this was, uh, so this was good work going on, um, but uh, in, in 2004, I was at a conference in London and I was uh, pursued uh, by Victor Kataliansky, who is the, um, <coughs> the uh, at yeah, that point was the VP research uh, for Al Nylum Pharmaceuticals, a company based in Boston. Now, Al Nylum was founded uh, in 2002 uh, to use sRNA as a therapeutic. And uh, so fairly big molecule, 13 kilodaltons, and the uh, <clears throat> 21 mer. Um, but he said, we have a delivery problem. They wanted to use these molecules to silence the gene in the liver. Uh, and how do we get the, how, how can we do that? How can we deliver uh, the sRNA to the liver? This resulted in uh, a really successful collaboration uh, between Al Nylum and, uh, and um, <clears throat> INX and subsequently Acuitas uh, to uh, develop uh, the um, <clears throat> LMP sRNA systems to silence genes in the liver. So as uh, so over the period 2005 to 2012, uh, we tested, um, we synthesized many different ionizable lipids and other lipids. Uh, we <clears throat> tested over 300 formulations. And uh, as I'll point out, uh, the, it resulted in a, an LMP system uh, that had remarkable properties in terms of gene silencing. So we started with the question, uh, can the, uh, <clears throat> these lipid nanoparticle systems uh, containing uh, siRNA, uh, and, uh, and ionizable lipids, can they silence genes in the liver following an IV injection? And uh, just, to, just to get back to, uh, to basics of it, lipid nanoparticles get into cells by, um, by the process called endocytosis, as we're all well aware. Uh, and so what we need to do here is to break out of the endosome, deliver the contents inside, into the cytoplasm, before things go on to uh, the lysosomes where they're gonna get broken down or else there's a recycling process here as well that can get uh, recycled to the cell surface. So uh, there's the, so we need to design these, these uh, lipid nanoparticles so they really just destabilize the endosome at some critical point. Now, how do ionizable lipids destabilize endosomes? And what, one thing we found, and this was in related in studies that we conducted around 2000, is that if we take an anionic lipid, a negatively charged lipid found in membranes such as phosphatidylserine or phosphatidylglycerol or phosphatidylinositol, et cetera, uh, and add, if we put that, that is a bilayer line shape if it, it, in, in the presence of water. However, if we add a cationic lipid to that, it'll flip it over to these non bilayer structures to a hexagonal H2 phase as indicated here. And so this is just rationalized by the shape, shape idea that if we have a, a, uh, <clears throat> the, the lipids that have opposite charge, they'll associate and uh, they uh, adopt more of, we say, of a cone shape, which is compatible, obviously, with the, 
with the hexagonal phase. And so we, we really were, uh, they'll push back to the bipolymorphism, which we'd been studying in detail some 20 years before. So the, um, the, uh, or the, the, this affected our design of the ionizable uh, cationic lipids. Uh, we had to uh, basically um, design them so they had the maximum um, ability to uh, combine with a negatively charged lipid in the endosome. There's lots of negatively charged lipid there. Uh, and so to, to, to uh, disrupt the membrane and release the oligonucleotides. So we, this, th these, these design features uh, we assessed in an in vivo model. One of the things we learned uh, working with anti-cancer drugs is that uh, the, what you see in vitro isn't necessarily what you're gonna see in vivo. And so we use this high throughput factor seven mouse model, injecting uh, lipid nanoparticles containing sRNA against factor seven. Intravenously, uh, factor seven is of course made in the liver. It's a clotting protein, uh, but we can detect that in the blood some 24 hours later. And, it, and so if we get delivery into the hepatocytes, we're gonna see less factor seven in the blood. And so this is a way of ascertaining the potency of our systems. What we found was that the potency was very sensitive to the species of, of the ionized volcanic lipid that we employed. This just indicates the progression uh, through, uh, through five of those, but we had, as was indicated before, many, many others. And what we discovered uh, <clears throat> through this process was uh, that the, um, <clears throat> the potency uh, was, the, the pKa of the, in other words, the pH, which these the ionized lipids get protonated, really determined how active uh, they are. The, um, this is a log plot uh, of potency, and potency is one over the effective dose at which you get 50% gene silencing. Uh, the, so if you move as little as a half a pH unit away in terms of the pKa, uh, you can decrease the potency by, by two orders of magnitude or more. So this was really a fundamental finding that uh, there is a critical a very critical PKA that one has to observe. So as a result of these studies, uh, we moved from systems that could silence the gene in the liver uh, <clears throat> with an effective dose of say 10 milligrams of sRNA per kilogram to uh, systems that um, silence at, uh, at as little as five micrograms of uh, sRNA per kilogram. Uh, and that were, if anything, less toxic. So in other words, you could give a thousand times higher dose uh, before we would see any toxicity. So um, one of the nice things about, about these gene therapy approaches uh, is that uh, if we can silence factor seven, we can silence any gene in the hepatocytes. And so the clinicians at Al Nilam chose to develop a, a lipid nanoparticle system uh, that uh, <clears throat> to treat a hereditary disease uh, that you've never heard of, but uh, transthyretin induced amyloidosis uh, which affects approximately 50,000 people worldwide. Um, <clears throat> Transthyretin is made in the liver. Uh, it, uh, if there's mutations in it, uh, the, um, it can form these fibrils in the circulation, these fibrils deposit throughout the body uh, and cause really nasty effects in nervous tissue and cardiac tissue. Uh, the, um, there's no effective therapy. It's usually fatal within five years of diagnosis. And it's a pretty unpleasant disease, as is indicated here uh, for the various stages that uh, this individual uh, went through. And of course, if you then had, if you had troubles, uh, say, walking at the age of 30 or so, you'd know what you were in for, because this, as a hereditary disease, you're likely to have seen an uncle or other relative, um, <clears throat> you know, go through, go through the process. And so the... Um, this is very simple in terms of the potential treatment. Uh, if we can inhibit the production of transthyretin in the liver, we should be able to reduce the levels of, uh, of the fibrils. And if we get really lucky, um, then uh, perhaps we can even dissolve some of the already established plaques. So it's potentially a simple solution uh, to what is obviously a devastating disease. So the first stage of this was to look at, at human volunteers. Uh, the, uh, to determine what the effective dose would be. And in these volunteers, it was found that 0 0.3, but 0 0.15 milligrams per kilogram, you'd see a really profound uh, decrease in the levels of circulating transthyresin. Uh, at point, and this lasted for a time on the order of two or th three or four weeks. And so on the basis of this 0.3 mg per kg, 
every three weeks uh, was chosen as the uh, dose level in the clinic. There's a phase three study uh, that commenced around about 2015, 2016, 225 patients, 148 getting uh, what was then termed patacerin uh, at a 0.3 mg per kg uh, every three weeks, or sterile saline as a placebo um, in the control group. And then the, uh, the endpoints was a change in the neural impairment score at 18 months, the primary endpoints, secondary endpoints, quality of life, weakness, ability to walk, et cetera. Now, what was found was that over this 18 month period that the trial went on was really quite astonishing because those individuals who were uh, getting the lipid nanoparticle containing sRNA to silence transthyretin were, if anything, getting better. Their neural, neural, impairment, neural impairment score was improving. Uh, whereas those on the placebo, uh, they were, had, had a higher, a higher neural, neural impairment score, which correlates with greater disability. So really resulting in improvement for people suffering from a previously fatal disease, uh, <coughs> hereditary disease. Now the, the, uh, this, uh, the results were announced in 2017. Uh, the, um, this was, these are probably the best uh, clinical trial results I've ever seen. Uh, p-values, I always refer to this as one over Avogadro's number. There's absolutely no doubt this, uh, this uh, drug works. An all secondary endpoint um, <clears throat> were met uh, with uh, equally convincing uh, p-values. So it's a stabilizing and potential and possibly curative uh, therapy for a previously fatal disease. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, this was uh, then approved by the FDA in, uh, in 2018. Uh, the first FDA approval of an sRNA-based uh, gene therapy drug. And it's certainly a, a, a robust clinical validation of the LMP delivery system. And so it really dem dramatically demonstrates uh, the power of gene therapies, where gene therapies are just defined as the ability to introduce uh, RNA, DNA inside, inside a cell as a therapeutic. So let's move on now to the... Uh, to the uh, mRNA-based drugs, which uh, occurred starting around about 2012. Uh, the uh, Onpatro uh, went into the clinic in 2012. And so a company that I co-founded called Acuitas, uh, we continued on uh, the, um, <clears throat> with, this, with this approach, but started to ask the question, well, if we can deliver siRNA, maybe we can deliver mRNA uh, and the sRNA, of course, silencing genes in the liver, but maybe with mRNA, we could actually get genes to be expressed in the liver, proteins to be expressed in the liver. And uh, so this is work that commenced in 2012. Uh, <clears throat> exactly the same sort of process is for uh, the antisense, but in this case, we're packaging mRNA as opposed to sRNA, uh, injecting intravenous in the same, in the same lipid nanoparticles or a very similar one. And then asking the question, can we, in the liver, uh, <clears throat> can we, can, can we uh, get proteins to be expressed? This turned out to be, uh, to be possible. I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, the, the, it's quite, quite surprising in many ways, uh, but uh, the, uh, this is just an early experiment where we're showing uh, that um, there is a dose-dependent um, luciferase expression uh, <clears throat> if we have mRNA coding for luciferase uh, in the liver. And uh, so Acuitas has taken this on to develop uh, <coughs> uh, optimized systems with really improved ionized lipids and other components. And this is one example. We can now use the liver as a bioreactor to produce really any protein we want. And so this is super physiological levels of erythropoietin uh, being produced in a pig model, uh, <coughs> a single IV injection. So really quite, you know, this is obviously a huge number of potential therapeutics that can be uh, imagined on the basis of this observation, uh, but uh, the uh, and that's, uh, those are certainly being pursued as we speak. Uh, but in, uh, in about 2014, we were approached uh, by Drew Weissman and uh, Katie Carrico by Nemtech. What they <clears throat> what they wanted was a delivery system for mRNA vaccines. So this uh, Victor, this takes us back to the uh, interaction with L nylum. Uh, the, uh, Drew and Katie had worked for many years to, uh, to basically make uh, mRNA less immunogenic, uh, more suitable for a vaccine, uh, but they had this delivery problem. How do we get mRNA coding for viral proteins into muscle and immune cells in vivo? 
So this is just indicating here in cartoon form, uh, <clears throat> introducing uh, the, the, in this case, of course, we'd have mRNA coding for a viral protein, uh, introduce that into muscle cells or into antigen presenting cells and get uh, hopefully robust MHC1, MHC2 class uh, immune responses uh, <clears throat> as a result and thereby develop a, a vaccine. The first, the first uh, well, there was two studies that, or a number of studies, uh, one of which focused on Zika virus, the other on, um, <clears throat> on influenza. And uh, it turned out uh, that these were quite remarkably good vaccines. So in this case, mRNA uh, coding for the, um, the Zika virus pre-membrane and envelope glycoprotein, and introducing this in a, um, in a mouse model. Uh, introduced, in this case, it was uh, intradermally injected, and then challenging the, mou the mouse <coughs> with, the, um, with the Zika virus uh, subsequent to that at two weeks or at 20 weeks. And as indicated here, uh, the, uh, this, this resulted in uh, total protection against Zika virus. Uh, <coughs> that uh, there was a challenge at two weeks or 20 weeks. Uh, there was no, no, none of the mice got infected. Uh, for, for those that were in the, um, the cohort uh, that uh, was getting a lipid nanoparticle with the mRNA coding uh, for the envelope glycoprotein. So th this, this then triggered a, uh, a collaboration between Acuitas and uh, BioNTech uh, that um, was uh, commenced in 2018, 2019, that was really focused on, uh, influ on influenza vaccines. Um, but uh, and, and uh, the um, the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the BioNTech was also working with Pfizer on a flu vaccine. But of course, uh, when the pandemic hit in January 2020, uh, all the efforts switched to uh, making a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, so the, uh, the, um, the the lipid nanoparticle we provided through Acutus. Uh, now was re was altered uh, to contain mRNA coding for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike glycoprotein. Uh, the um, <clears throat> the results of this uh, this trial are uh, everybody uh, has, has seen this data. Uh, this uh, this was announced in November eight, uh, in 2020, uh, certainly showing that uh, the uh, what was termed BNT162b2 was 95 percent effective. Uh, to prevent uh, infection by um, by co the COVID-19 virus, uh, the, this efficacy was, uh, the, was consistent across age, gender, race, ethnicity, etc., and that uh, the, uh, the the vaccine was well tolerated. At that point, uh, the um, <clears throat> they anticipated uh, producing up to 1.3 billion doses by the end of 2021. I think it ended up being closer to 3 billion. And of course, uh, this vaccine has been has been approved in many many jurisdictions. So uh, that, that's the story of the uh, that, that uh, leads up to the vaccine. But I just want to close emphasizing uh, that lipid nanoparticles are really enabling many gene therapies. And I'll just give a, a, a few examples of that uh, that are uh, really are starting to point out uh, the um, the. Uh, <clears throat> Robustness of the uh, and the and the, the range of, of applications. Obviously, for vaccines, uh, this is uh, you know there's a, there's a huge number of possibilities here. A lipid nanoparticle containing mRNA coding for a variety of uh, HAs from um, uh, of, from various influenza uh, strains, and showing effectiveness against or protection against a. a, a uh, uh, flu viruses from 1999, 1934, and other, uh, 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 as well as uh, some other um, uh, variants. Uh, so the potential for a universal flu vaccine, so we don't have to have to uh, have one every year, is certainly on the table. Uh, <clears throat> cardiovascular disease. Um, this is gene editing. Uh, this is work that's been done by Verve Therapeutics. And uh, showing that uh, by by knocking down PCSK9, uh, one can, in a dose-dependent way, uh, have um, <clears throat> the, I think the results are out to about a year now, but have uh, a, you know a very a very significant reductions in LDL levels, 
that um, are, 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 uh, <coughs> are certainly the, at least the problem of adherence to various protocols for some of the um, statins, for example. This is a base editing of PCSK9 to, uh, to uh, uh, reduce LDL cholesterol. For heart failure, um, the study that just came out in science, uh, the, um, and this is uh, using CAR T, uh, <clears throat> a CAR T approach uh, to, um, to treat cardiac fibrosis, in essence, uh, training T cells to go after activated fibroblasts. And this abrogates uh, fibrosis, restores cardiac function after injury. And so this is just indicated here that the percent fibrosis uh, in these animal models that are subjected to heart injury and then treated, and then their, their um, uh, fibrosis is reduced, ejection fraction comes back to normal, et cetera, et cetera. So you can abrogate fibrosis, restore cardiac function, uh, whether this will be useful for um, treatment of uh, heart failure. Uh, is, uh, well, the likelihood is certainly there. Uh, the, um, this is a uh, hereditary disease that I mentioned with HATTR, but of course now you can use uh, the, um, the, the gene editing approach to, uh, to knock, knock this, uh, <clears throat> this uh, translate region down. And these are results from Intellia uh, in the clinic that is actually in Non-human primates, they've got data going out to a year. Uh, this, they're here, they're into month two, but uh, again, indicating that you can get robust and, uh, and long lasting. Um, this is kind of a one and done process, only one, only one uh, dose, but um, a pretty um, impressive uh, <clears throat> reduction in the uh, levels of circulating TTR uh, and, uh, and presumably resolution of disease. Uh, aging, uh, the, the uh, certainly a lot, there, there's a number of longevity proteins that are uh, becoming uh, quite uh, quite interesting. FGF21 expressing FGF21 in the liver. This is a uh, a, a paper that just came out from AstraZeneca, uh, essentially pointing out that LMP dosing of this is for diet-induced obese mice. Uh, it reduces their body weight, as is indicated here. Uh, at the same food intake, but also reduces uh, you know, plasma glucose, insulin, triglycerides, and cholesterol. I haven't got the data shown here, but you know, quite remarkable possibilities uh, in terms of these approaches. So uh, just in summary, I spent um, you know, 50 years, uh, I put worrying about lipids, well, thinking about lipids for sure anyway, uh, and, uh, and, and lipid nanoparticles. I just want to emphasize that all of this work really depended very, very much on our basic studies on lipid polymorphism and lipid asymmetry. And we wouldn't have had the tools uh, to get to where we did uh, with, the, um, with the therapeutic applications without that basic, uh, that basic understanding. So it's really been quite a journey. Uh, the, um, and obviously it's not one that was taken in any way alone. This is a work of hundreds and probably closer to a thousand people. But I wanna particularly acknowledge um, some people, Mick Hope and Tom Madden uh, worked with for four, over 40 years now, as well as Steve Ansel, Ying Tan, Barb Mui, Paula Lin, 20 years in, uh, or more with all of those people. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, the um, Al Nilam uh, 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 interaction in, in mid 2000s was pivotal with Mark Tracy, Akina King, Martin Mayer, and Mana Manaharan. Marco Cipollini and, uh, <clears throat> really broke the problem of the ionizable lipids uh, when we really needed to get a less, uh, less toxic version, and he came up with it. Uh, these things work in the brain. I didn't talk about that. Uh, and my own group, and of course, Drew Weissman at the University of Pennsylvania. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and um, take any questions if we have time. Thank you very much, Peter, for sharing your learnings over the many years. That was very interesting. And so I'll hand over the, the word to, to the next uh, session chair and presenter. Please uh, spare your questions for after the talk. <clears throat>